Live from Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York, I'm Shanali Basak. And I'm Tim Stenovec. Welcome to Bloomberg Crypto. We'll look at the people, transactions, and technology shaping the world of decentralized finance. And crypto prices, they're surging as surprisingly there are now signs of U.S. approval of Ether ETFs on the horizon. We're going to bring you the latest. We're also on the verge of an expected U.S. House vote on the regulatory framework bill for digital assets. We speak about the legislation with Sheila Warren, Crypto Council for Innovation CEO. And speaking of D.C., we're going to discuss the big industry money investing in this year's political races, especially through super PACs, as groups look to influence the path forward for crypto. All that and more ahead on Bloomberg Crypto. First, though, here's a snapshot of the market. Now, typically on the show, we start with Bitcoin. It is the largest crypto after all. And yes, it has been on a tear. But make no mistake, the past 24 hours, they've been all about Ether. Look at that. In the last 24 hours, Ether rose nearly 14% yesterday. It was its biggest jump going all the way back to November of 2022. This all on signs of momentum toward U.S. approval of ETFs that invest directly in Ether. Now, thanks to yesterday's jump and continued momentum today, Ether up more than 30 percent just in the last week, still off its recent March highs and about 20 percent below all time highs. It's not just Ether, though, that's moving higher. Bitcoin also surging in recent days yesterday up more than 5 percent. Over the last week, up nearly 15%. Look at that, more than 13%, Shanali. Tim, it's been quite the rise here. And over the last 24 hours is where you've seen most of the excitement come. Because, of course, we knew that the SEC was reticent when it came to these Ethereum ETFs. But now there are signs of life in conversations about those 19B4 filings, which is one of the filings. Of course, there are S1s as well. Critical deadlines coming up for a number of issuers. Van Eck, ARC, Hashtex, and Grayscale all before the end of May have certain deadlines to be seen. Let's see how the SEC reacts to them. But of course, there are some signs of life in this market. And of course, some repeat issuers here, ones that have bought out the Bitcoin ETFs like BlackRock, Franklin Templeton, and Invesco, big names here, Fidelity, also looking to bring out Ethereum ETFs as well. Well, something that I've got my eye on is the uh, Ether narrowing the gap between Bitcoin over the last year. We've seen Bitcoin pretty consistently outperform Ether, but thanks to that Ether rally over the last week, much of it happening yesterday on that speculation that we could be getting close to a spot Ether ETF, that gap is actually narrowing. So over the last year, Ether up just a little over 100%, about 107%. Well, Bitcoin higher Shanali by about 160%. Now, Bloomberg Intelligence is raising the odds that the SEC approves Ether ETFs to 75%. Let's discuss this with Bloomberg Intelligence ETF guru Eric Belchunas watching this market so closely. But as we've been talking about, it's one filing. There are a number of steps here. How do you think through what this latest sign of life means to the path towards an Ethereum ETF approval? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a complete 180 uh, from the SEC. Uh, the reason we were so bearish at 25% odds um, before yesterday was that everybody in the process was pretty bearish. Uh, they were caught flat-footed by this when trading and markets reached out and said, hey, can you update your filings? Um, and the sort of the, the rumor and the sort of tea leaves is that this was a political shift. Um, you know, the Democrats don't really want to see Trump owning this crypto issue, and he, he started to. And now it's an election issue. They don't want to lose votes. So the ETF kind of got like sort of sucked into this situation and it looks like they're, you know, again, going to fast track this. Uh, unclear exactly when it will launch. Uh, the 19 befores uh, I heard were due back this morning at 10 a.m. Um, those could be approved by Thursday or they have to be at least approved. Uh, that's the deadline. And then the S1s, as you mentioned earlier, uh, could take a little while longer. We're unclear whether this will be an all hands on deck fire drill from the SEC or if corporate finance which is the division that approves S1s, will take their time. Normally, this all happens weeks before. So this was clearly like them turning on a dime and sh shifting from denial to approval, and that's where we're at. So our, our odds immediately went to 75%. We're leaving a little room for, for uh, we're not going to 100, obviously, just because this is unusual and a seemingly a political issue. So you, you can't go to 100%, in my opinion. Hey, Eric, um, we have a little bit of history here because of what happened with the spot Bitcoin ETFs a little earlier this year. And when I say history, we have an idea of what happened with price because that was a big unknown ahead of that spot Bitcoin approval ETF and the launches of those ETFs as well. 
I, I'm wondering if we can look at that history back in March to extrapolate what could happen with prices of ether. I mentioned the 14% rise yesterday, the best single day going all the way back to November 2022. So I want you to look into your crystal ball and tell us what exactly is priced in right now if these were to get approved. <laughs> You're trying to get me in trouble. Uh, we can't do uh, price predictions at, at BI. But here, here's what I will say. I believe Bitcoin went up something like 60 to 70 percent between the June filing from BlackRock for the Bitcoin and the time it was approved. So I think the rumor was worth 70 percent. Then when they launched, there was a bump, but then there was a sell the news. But they're since up 46 percent from that point. So clearly the launch helped. I think the flows overwhelmed uh, uh, expectations a little. So that brings me to the question, like, how much uh, are people going to pile in before? How much of the sell the news will there be? There'll probably be a little bit. Uh, and then will there be a second win? Now, Ether ETFs, you have to understand, um, in Hong Kong, they launched there with Bitcoin, and they only got 15% of the assets that Bitcoin got. So we're kind of sticking there. We've looked at other areas where Ether does exist in the ETF ecosystem. And I think 10 to 15% of the assets that Bitcoin gets is probably pretty fair. Um, we'll see how it plays out. So I wouldn't look at this as to be as big of a deal. Uh, I think a lot of 60, 40 normal type investors probably satisfy just buying a Bitcoin ETF for their quote crypto exposure. Uh, but just being in an ETF obviously is beneficial given how they uh, are so accessible and they'll be low cost and they'll probably be liquid. Eric, but you know, those layer twos, right? I mean, how much does the average investor know about what is built on Ethereum? You know, but in all reality here, what about this uh, timeline question? Because you do see a lot of people trading on these pivotal moments. Can you create a roadmap here on what investors should be looking out for? Yeah, so look at documents. Documents coming in today, what do they say? First thing we're looking at is that they're not gonna allow staking. That's one thing we got today. We're also looking that it looks like they're going to be filed as a commodity trust, and that's okay, which means the SEC will kind of ipso facto be admitting that ETH is not a security, at least unstaked ETH. That's interesting. And then for Thursday or even Wednesday afternoon, look for the approval. You know, if that happens, that's one step. Not We're not out of the woods yet. But they wouldn't really approve the 19B4 unless they had plans to approve the S1s. Then you look for the S1s. Fidelity already updated their S1 this morning. So ARC updated theirs recently. So we could see S1s flow in and it could just be an avalanche of updated documents for the next like couple days. And we'll see when the dust settles. If I had to handicap it, I would say maybe a week. We'll have really clear picture of when the launch date will be. And we do think they'll put them all out at once. You know, we called the other one the Cointucky Derby. We're calling this one the Ethnus Stakes. <laughs> uh, just to stick with the second leg of the Triple Crown. I don't know if it'll be a third, but uh, it will be a horse race type deal with all nine or ten lined up on the same day, we think. OK, well, we'll have to find a third. So there will indeed be a triple crown. Eric <laughs> Balchunas of Bloomberg Intelligence, thank you so much. Always appreciate it when you join us. Let's now turn to Medified CEO Frank Spizer. He joins us from Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Frank, good to have you with us. We're going to get to Medified in just a second. But first, I do want to start with the Ether ETF news that we were just talking about with Eric Balchunas. It has certainly caught the market by surprise. But is it something that you think will certainly happen? Is it a given? No, I don't think it's fair to say that it's a given. Um, however, it, it is a, a market change um, from regulator, regulators that shows that they're willing to look into new types of innovation in the market that probably the appetite wasn't there before. So uh, that type of change means that I would say it's probable. It's not guaranteed until it happens, though, um, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, what about some of the big changes at the issuers here? Of course, it was a massive move in the market to see Grayscale announce that their CEO, Michael Sonnenschein, would be stepping down, particularly given he was the person that led the conversion here from uh, trust to ETF. What does it mean for one of the largest issuers here to be changing leadership at this time? I actually think it's a pretty, it's a pretty forward-looking move especially to replace him with somebody from Goldman, uh, if I'm correct on that, right? Where, where somebody's gonna come into to the spot, um, lend some sort of traditional credibility to the space uh, and show maybe we're moving past the stage where we segment the world into TradFi and Web3 and just look at what's better for you know consumers and users of the financial system. I think this, is, this could be a change where it, it mainstreams um, crypto to 
you know, bring it, bring it to a place where more people can use it, more people can trust it, more people can access it, which is the, the promise of blockchain all along. Frank, what else needs to happen in your opinion to completely mainstream crypto? Well, we need to make sure that what has been seen as crypto problems, the SBF stuff, the Luna things, those were not crypto problems. Those were people problems that weren't solved by writing good enough contracts and things like that. So first we need to finish the PR fight and un have let people understand that you're, you're not going to get rid of the flaws in human nature, but you can use this technology to do better for people. So I think that's like a, a good step forward. And then the second step forward is just to see applications and uses of, of things like what's going to happen with Ethereum. Uh, when, when those types of things make it into the market and it makes mm -hmm. things better, faster, cheaper, then I think you'll see people come aboard and realize like, yeah, this is going to be better for me. I can send money to people. I can, right. I can set up deals, set up contracts and sort of own, own my, uh, Get, bring some agency in my participation in the economic system. Hey, Frank, before we let you go, you're the co-founder and former CEO of Social Flow. I think a lot of people in publishing know about it because it helps content companies get their audience engaged. Now you've got Metified taking a similar approach to investing in crypto. What exactly does it does it do? It's built on the on the mantle layer two Ethereum. Um, so talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so um, we basically have a AI driven, we use recurrent and convolutional neural nets to do near-term price prediction. Um, you know, so we took the AI ethos of Social Flow and we've sort of ported it to to this where what we do is we understand near-term price movements and we help harvest volatility for, for hedge funds. And now we're moving to make a product available for access by retail investors as well. Layer two, certainly a hot topic. We will talk more about it throughout the course of this show. Metified CEO, Frank Spicer, we thank you so much for your time and for weighing in on the big news of the day. Now coming up, we're going to talk about House leaders because they have a plan to put a crypto regulatory framework on the House floor as early as this week. We're going to discuss that with Sheila Warren. And to access all of the latest data and news on crypto, check out CRYP Go on the Bloomberg Terminal. This is Bloomberg. are in the digital age, that it's time to bring our financial system into the 21st century. Uh, what the FIT bill, as it's referred to, the market structure bill does is essentially start to lay out those uh, ground rules, the, the uh, playing field, so that people who innovate in the digital space, people who are creating the next great uh, internet, uh, are able to do that here in this country. That was Republican Majority Whip Tom Emmer last night talking about a new bill that would impact the crypto regulatory framework. With us now, Balance of Power co-host Kaylee Lines joins us from Washington, D.C. Kaylee, if this bill uh, gets through the House, it's likely to fail in the Senate. What exactly is the point if it's not even going to make it to the president's desk? Well, certainly, Tim, it is an uphill climb for this actually to become law. But this is an effort that has been underway and pushed for by the likes of Patrick McHenry, the chair of the House Financial Services Committee, for quite a long time. This first bill is really the big one, the market structure bill, the Financial Innovation and Technology for the 21st Century Act, also known as FIT21, essentially delineates what authority belongs to the CFTC, which would then be an overseer of, quote, digital commodities, versus the SEC, which would have responsibility over restricted digital assets, so things off as part of an investment contract. Think of something like an initial coin offering. This is an effort that was both Financial Services and Agriculture Committee uh, behind it. It passed out of committee last year. And I spoke with Tom Emmer, as we just heard from the House Majority Whip last night, and he said he does think it will have the votes to pass on the House floor. He thinks the votes are also there for his other bill that the House could vote on this week, the CBDC Anti-Surveillance State Act, which would essentially say the Fed can't launch a CBDC without the explicit approval of Congress, and it would need to operate like cash. So even if these things do pass in the House, which, again, Tom Emmer is confident they will, the Senate is a very different story. There are a lot more pro-anti-crypto uh, or skeptical crypto lawmakers 
lawmakers there, including the chair of the Senate Banking Committee, the Democrat from Ohio, Sherrod Brown, who has been much more skeptical of the industry. I just, would just note, though, that a lot of lobbying effort is underway on the Hill to get this thing uh, across the floor. Certainly a lot of financial resources have been poured into this and could as well in this election cycle as there's a trio of crypto super PACs that have tens of millions of dollars at their disposal, including Fairshake, which can mobilize money against vulnerable incumbents who potentially aren't as friendly to crypto, like Sherrod Brown, who is in a very difficult Senate race with a uh, blockchain company founder, Bernie Moreno, in Ohio. So certainly there is a lot of, of policy and lobbying force behind this effort. Assuming it passes the House, though, there is no guarantee, Tim, that this will become law and that all those efforts will result in this legislation getting a signature from President Biden. Kaylee, we thank you so much for keeping an eye on all of the ins and outs. We're going to discuss this vote now with Sheila Warren, CEO of the Crypto Council for Innovation, which has a strong interest in this bill. But Sheila, what is the impetus to move this forward when there is such strong pushback in the Senate and the likelihood of it getting past that pushback? Well, Shanelle, I think that for us, this represents the most significant response to industry calls for regulation and regulatory clarity that we've seen. This bill, as Kaylee noted, has been around for quite some time, kicking around, and it is groundbreaking. It is absolutely groundbreaking and looks to solve problems that have been talked about for quite some time. So our view, I think, as industry actors, is if we're not going to support something that addresses um, things in a way that we've been looking for, you know, what are we going to support, right? The politics of this are really complicated, as Kaylee also noted, extremely complicated. But in our view, this does have bipartisan support. Hmm. We are seeing an unprecedented um, collaboration between the Ag Committee, the Financial Services Committee, uh, and a true bipartisan push uh, from many folks across the aisle to get this thing across the line, particularly in the House. Sheila, I'm curious about the polling that, that you have either internally or that you've referred to internally, and, and to what extent exactly voters actually care about crypto. So, so what can you tell us whether or not they actually care about this? Yeah, Tim. So I think, you know, people vote or don't vote for many reasons. OK, and I do think that crypto holders uh, tend to be voters. And so when we have actually pulled uh, likely voters, so we don't pull just like every, you know, random Tom, Dick and Harry, we pull likely voters uh, and overwhelmingly they are in favor of crypto regulation here in the United States at the federal level. So when you consider the fact that you've got a huge swath of American of, of, from across the parties, from Republicans, Democrats, independents, over 20 percent are ownership of crypto, uh, digital wallets. Uh, this is this is an innovation that is, as Tom Emmer has said, as Representative Emmer has said, we're in the digital age and we're only moving there faster and faster. So when you look at younger demographics, when you look at people of color, when you look at rural versus urban, there's not a real divide in terms of who's looking to digital assets, who owns them and who holds them. Now, again, people vote for many reasons. But I do think that crypto and the lack of movement on crypto regulation gets a lot of airtime and not just from the industry. And I think people are very frustrated by that. They want to be able to access these assets. They want to know they're doing it in a safe and sound way. They want to know that they're being protected and they want American companies building in this space. So uh, the answers are very clear in my mind. And that's the reason you're seeing so much, I would argue, outsized attention being mm -hmm. paid to this one uh, area. It's really clear that a lot of crypto money is going to candidates uh, across the floor when you look at the House and the Senate. But back to the Senate for a second, because some of the people that we're talking about here, like Sherrod Brown, have been long standing and long standing um, lawmakers here that have really overseen the course of financial uh, regulation and innovation for the better part of the last decade or more. So realistically, when you look at that crypto money going in, how much can it move the needle for some of the people that have been there the longest? Well, again, I think these are complicated questions. And what we're seeing is that even though the Biden administration, look, in 2022, we had the executive order that came down that said, hey, everyone, look, all these agencies pay attention to this stuff. We want to make sure it's developed responsibly. We want to keep it on shore, you know, uh, and we want we, we are tasking folks with taking a look at how to do that. Uh, and then you've seen this kind of like weakening, I think, of that stance by the Biden administration. But we've also seen that there has been departure from that. So last week's vote on the CRA on SAB 121, uh, I think, was monumental. Uh, you had everyone from Majority Leader Schumer, you know, you had um, Senator Casey, you know, you had folks that were kind of saying, look, we think it's time to take this stuff seriously. Uh, we think that we need to be retaining this, this um, innovation, this innovation space onshore. We need to be looking to protect consumers. And the way to do that historically has been to legislate, mm -hmm. right? So I do think you're seeing some, uh, it's not a, the party's not monolithic on this topic is what I want to say, right? The party's right. not monolithic. 
everyone has their own mind about this stuff. And we're seeing some of that start to play out in the, the way people are voting. Sheila, um, we've talked a lot about uh, members of the House, members of the Senate, but I'm, I'm wondering, going to the top here ahead of the 2024 election, it is an election year, and I'm wondering who is better for the crypto industry? In your view, should it be President Biden or former President Trump come November? Yeah, Tim, I think that's a big frame on the conversation. Depends if you're looking narrowly or if you're looking broadly. Uh, in my mind, I think stability and security of the economy, I think security, national security, security of national interests, American interests is really, really important. So people are going to answer that question differently depending on the frame that they're taking. Uh, Which I will frame say do you when take? It comes to I, I take the broadest frame possible. Uh, I tend to be a person who looks at the global markets. I tend to think that this is a global industry that operates in a global way. Um, I think that it is pretty clear that when it comes down to the individual candidates uh, and what they have said or not said, or what their you know administrative agencies have said or not said, uh, I do think that you see President Trump being more overtly and openly supportive of digital assets and crypto than President Biden. But I will also say that until the votes are counted, nothing is in, and there is time to change some of that. We wrote an op-ed, uh, Justin Slaughter and I wrote an op-ed recently that really said, you know, you wouldn't need a ton of movement on the part of Democrats, Democratic Party, or President Biden uh, to turn the tide in terms of crypto voters and how they're feeling about things. It's not that the Democratic Party have to come out and say, writ large, mm -hmm. this is not part of our platform. We love crypto. It's our favorite thing ever, right? But it would have to be this recognition, I think, at a, at a, somewhat at a party level, that this is an important right. innovation. There's something here that's sticky, and we should be paying attention to it. Sheila, appreciate you joining us, as always. That's Sheila Warren, CEO of the Industry Lo uh, Lobbyist, the Crypto Council for Innovation. After the break, a number of hedge funds bought up Bitcoin ETFs last quarter. More on the latest 13Fs right after this. This is Bloomberg. Now to some crypto stories that caught our attention this week. Hedge funds, pension funds, banks, they're all putting money into Bitcoin ETFs. 13F filings showed that funds including 0.72, Millennium and Elliott are among them and some may have opened the position as part of a trade meant to profit from the cryptocurrency's volatility or to offset a short position in derivatives. And CME Group is in discussions to launch Bitcoin trading. That's according to a report by the FT. CME has been holding talks with traders who want to buy and sell the cryptocurrency currency on a regulated marketplace, the report said. CME recently overtook Binance as the world's largest Bitcoin futures market. And that's all for Bloomberg Crypto. Of course, some major players entering the space. And as it gets more institutional, we'll be covering it all for you. Join us next week, same time, same place. This is Bloomberg Crypto, and this is Bloomberg.